Um, well, welcome to all. I'm Bill Maloney, Chief Economist for Equitable Growth Finance Institutions. Welcome to this seminar on the labor market impacts of COVID-19. Uh, COVID has radically depressed labor markets, leading in the advanced countries to some of the highest levels of unemployment since the Great Depression. It's also leading to big structural changes in both the advanced and developing countries that we need to understand as the bank um, among them. Uh, as Nick is going to talk a bit, a bit about, it's changing the nature of work. Um, uh, is it uh, it's likely to change the allocation of labor in the economy? There's a misallocation as a result of the distortions that have been induced by COVID. Um, we want to know how it's affected the inequality, both in remuneration, but in how the way we work. Certain people will have nice, uh, distant, safe and distant uh, access to their workplace. Others will not. Um, will the need for social distancing accelerate the trends towards automation? Um, has the revealed fragility of global value chains led towards reshoring? Um, is the need for social distancing going to lead to the ends of cities? Um, all these are open questions. They are, it's a huge amount of waterfront to cover. Um, but today we're privileged to have several researchers working exactly at the frontier of these issues. We have um, to begin, Nick Bloom, who is William Eberly, Professor of Economics at Stanford University um, and co-director of the Productivity, Innovation, and Entrepreneurship Program at the NBER, He's a friend of the bank. Um, we're glad to have you. Ed Glazer is Fred and Eleanor Glimp, Professor of Economics at Harvard University. Um, and then Bob Rikers from our own DECRG uh, is Senior Economist in the Trade International Integration Unit of the Development Research Group. And finally, David Autor is Ford Professor of Economics at MIT, um, and he is also a Faculty Research Associate of the NBER and a Research Affiliate of the Abdul Jamil Lat uh, Latin Poverty Action Lab. So we're going to have about 20 minutes for each, and uh, let's start with Nick. Okay, thanks. For oh, I need to uh, be able to share content, if that's okay, Ron. Yes. I can do that now. Okay, great. Uh, can you see my slides? Whoops. You can see my slides? Yes. Great. Okay, so <laughs> I'm going to talk about working from home. Uh, given I've only got 20 minutes, I, I'll just focus entirely on this. And this is joint work with uh, Jose Barrera, ITAM, and Steve Davis at Chicago. So as you'll not be surprised, working from home coverage in the U.S. is increased recently but to show you this i'm going to show you data up to january 2020 so this is the share of newspaper articles across the us so this is from a database of 2000 daily us newspapers we scraped for the number of articles that mention the word working from home and this goes back to 2000 until january january 2020 this had roughly been rising at about five percent a year a uh, couple of big prior spikes as marissa mayer uh, I don't know if people remember, but she canceled working from home at Yahoo, at least temporarily, in February 2013. I actually interviewed her a couple of weeks ago about this. It's an interesting story, but I doubt we're going to have time to go through it. And then uh, August 2019, Mitch McConnell and Rand Paul were both injured uh, and had to work from home. Mitch McConnell broke his shoulder and Rand Paul kind of weird, weirdly was assaulted by a neighbor. So um, anyway, that, 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 those are the spikes until now. This is the data if you run it up to June 2020. So working from home and media coverage has increased by 12,000%, 120-fold. So it's just been an enormous uh, increase in interest in working from home. So I'm going to talk about, just give you some data from a, four surveys on working from home before, during, and post-COVID, and then uh, briefly some tips I, you know, for, for the bank and other people listening that might be useful. So before COVID, by far the best data, is a fantastic Bureau of Labor Statistics survey from the ATIS, the American Time Use Survey, which covered around, um, two, which covered in 2017 and 2018, all wage and salary workers from a sample of around 10,000 people. And it stratified across states, industries, and geography. So this is a really great prior to COVID survey. So pre-COVID, what do we see? Well, only 15% of Americans have full-time paid working from home days. So I'm going to talk, focus on full time, uh, as in a full day working from home. I, I know many people, you know, work before work and in the evenings. 
but that doesn't count I, for the purposes I'm looking at. So I want to think about commuting and office space. So before COVID, only 50% of Americans would get an entire day working from home. If you look at the breakdown, eight of that 15%, the majority was occasionally, I guess I've been in that, or maybe I was maybe a day a week, but they're kind of people that sporadically work from home. If you look at the bottom, only 2% of us before COVID worked from home full time. So before COVID, that was extremely rare. There's a lot of basically the data entry jobs, uh, telesales jobs, or people whose spouse had moved. Like one of my friends, she moved from uh, California up to New York. Her husband worked in Cisco and he just can kept working for them, but he moved to switching to work from home full time. There was almost no one that was recruited as a graduate into full time working from home. It's pretty balanced by age and gender, perhaps surprisingly, but there aren't huge variations. It working from home before COVID was extremely unbalanced by education and by income. So on the left, if you look at people with less than a high school diploma, two and a half percent of them were working from home. And you can imagine why their face to face work, uh, you know, gardeners, cleaners, a lot of retail, some kind of lower pay business services. If you look at the far right column on the left figure, bachelor's degree and higher, more than a third of people here could work from home or did work from home sporadically even before COVID. Uh, the, these are much easier jobs to do remotely. I mean, probably everyone listening, I'm assuming, is working from home. And for us, you know, college plus educated, it's far easier to do this. And of course, that then maps over onto the income distribution. As you look at finer and finer data, working from home share increases as we go up the income distribution. That then maps over into occupations, not surprisingly, uh, professionals, managers, finance is very highly focused on working from home. So no, economists are a bit of a weird sell, but you know, having talked to, since the outbreaks begun, because of working on this beforehand, I've talked to, I don't know, 40, 50 firms in them, and they're working from home is heavily concentrated right now, in particular, you know, in high tech, finance, business services, et cetera, where almost entire companies have moved home. So that's before COVID. What about during COVID? So during COVID, uh, this is data from a survey of 2,500 US uh, residents. They're aged 20 to 64. They earned $20,000 or more in 2019. So they basically you think of them as should be working now. They were paid enough to be full-time workers last year, and you'd expect them to be working now. So this is data from late May. Um, what do we see here? Well, yeah, kind of amazingly, the biggest group are those that are currently working from home. So 42% of Americans are currently working from home. 33% of these people that were working last year are currently not working. Um, you know, reflects the uh, pretty savage nature of the recession. Uh, again, I'm sure that, you know, uh, Ed, Bob and David are going to talk much more ab about factors relating to this. And then 26% are working on their business premises. These are primarily essential service workers or some people not covered by lockdown. The thing that's kind of striking is if you weight this by 2019 earnings to get a sense of contribution to GDP, you notice only the top and bottom groups are actually in working right now, so effectively contributing to current GDP. And you know, two thirds of US GDP is being created by uh, home working based on this estimate, which is like enormous. Um, you know, if you'd asked me, uh, you know, six months ago, does working from home, you know, would we see now? Two thirds of US GDP created by working from. I, you know, I would have thought you were crazy, but as it happens, uh, you know, the US economy is now primarily driven by working from home. And in that sense, it's an, a critically important weapon against the pandemic. If it weren't for this, we'd, of course, you know, either the economy had collapsed or we'd have, you know, had to go back after two, three weeks of lockdown. So, in fact, working from home has turned out to be essential for dealing with the pandemic because it's enabled the economy to run at, you know, good but obviously not perfect levels of output uh, with the majority of people working from home. Another issue, and I'm sure Ed is going to talk about this, is just the geographic distribution of this. So working from home employees uh, are heavily drawn from city offices. So this shows the distribution of the workplaces, the business premises that current working from home employees used to be in. So think of this in 2019. And you notice that the majority of them are from city offices. I put at the bottom my <laughs> photos of my last four employers before Stanford. That's the London School of Economics, McKinsey, the Treasury, the UK Finance Ministry, and the Institute for Fiscal Studies in London. These are all classically in this, uh, they're all basically city offices. So there's been a huge movement 
of workers out of that daily commute into city offices, into working wherever they are, many of them in the suburbs and some of them even in rural areas. And this is a big issue for the vitality of the of city downtowns. So we asked these people how much they spent. So this is a second survey. Actually. We've run a second survey of two and a half thousand US residents uh, that's just completed. And we asked one, three of the questions we asked them is how much they spent on meals would include coffee, shopping and entertainment. For example, you go out for dinner after work or maybe going to the theater or see a movie uh, near their business premises. And you can see for this is the weekly figures for for workers that used to work in cities, that's about a couple of hundred dollars a week. So effectively for cities, we pulled an enormous amount of expenditure on entertainment, food and retail out of city centers uh, into suburbs. So I think, you know, I'll come back to it. I think a large chunk of working from home and indeed social distancing is here to stay. And this is a big threat in the medium run, at least, you know, it's hard to tell in the very long run to the to the vitality of cities. I should say, <laughs> Working from home under COVID is far from great. Post COVID, I'm going to argue it's like the promised land. It will be fantastic. Under COVID is really hard for four reasons. This is hardly a great scenario. So I'll go through them. I'm sure many people recognize this. So one is kids. Um, you know, I have four kids. This is my youngest, Catherine. She's very sweet. Well, at least I, <laughs> I think she is. But she like continuously comes into my room. She's four, wants to play. Uh, there's only so much television even a four-year-old would watch. And, you know, my older kids are kind of doing that homeschooling thing. Uh, but she is just floating around and coming in. And, you know, it, it's very hard to uh, work with Catherine continuously knocking on the door. And then second is job match. So there's a couple of ways to get at this. There's a great people paper by Jonathan Dingle and Brent Neiman uh, recently about looking at um, ONET kind of job activities. We took another way to measure this. We just did our survey in the first two and a half thousand person survey asked respondents, how efficiently could you do your job working from home? And you see that there's three groups really. There's a group that reports to being perfectly, if not more efficient. I'd assume that most academics are in that. That's around a third. There's a group at the bottom, about a third that couldn't do their work job from home either. So you can imagine many lower skilled jobs uh, you can do that, you know, working in a shop or construction site, et cetera. But there's a bunch of higher skilled jobs, uh, you know, doctors, surgeons have a friend that's an optometrist. She, has, she obviously has to go into work, pilots, et cetera. And then there's a group in the middle that can kind of do it imperfectly. Uh, you know, two examples of firms I've been talking to. One was I was speaking to the chief human resources officer in a very large U.S. multinational retailer. And she said, hey, look, a lot of my designers can't work from home perfectly because Sure, they can do stuff on the computer, but they also have to touch fabric and, you know, uh, look at stitches and the way things hangs on models. Or I've been speaking to two or three commercial property companies, and for them, it's been an issue because they actually, before they buy property, they want to look around it and see how tenants use it and see this, the flow of workers, etc. cetera. Um, third issue is space. <laughs> Here are, you know, two photos of uh, students of mine that have been facing issues. So on the left is Scarlett. So Scarlett, I was had a video conference with her and I noticed she, you know, she had a strange background. I couldn't figure out what it was. I asked her about it and Scarlett said, her and her fiance live in this small apartment and they're both on conference calls. It's so noisy that in the morning she has to sit on the shoe rack in the uh, clothes cupboard and he gets the living room and in the afternoon they rotate around. So half the day, we, you know, one of them or the other is sat on this, you know, horribly, uh, I mean, because you can imagine, you can see this thing trying to work in it. And on the right, Nikhil, who's a former undergrad student of mine I'm still in contact with, I had a call with him and uh, there was like something hanging behind the back of his ear and it turned out to be a shirt. And they asked, you know, Nikhil, where are you? And it turned out he was in his um, girlfriend's walk-in wardrobe. So, you know, again, no, no daylight. There's a lot of people with far from great experiences. And in fact, on the survey, less than half Americans have their own room, which is not their bedroom. So, I had a paper published in the Quarterly Journal of Economics on working from home in a, uh, a company called C-Trip. In fact, uh, um, it was a randomized control trial. I'm not going to go through it because of time, but this was run in uh, 2010 to 2012. And we sh show a big productivity impact on working from home. But in that experiment, uh, working from home employees had to have their own room, which is not their bedroom. They were not allowed school age kids and they had to have working broadband, a whole set of conditions that have completely disappeared under COVID. So these are not ideal circumstances to be in horrible locations 
Um, and it's not just the locations, the problem. Another issue is internet. So in the survey, I asked people about their internet connectivity and only 65% of Americans have internet that's good enough to support a proper video call, as in they have more than 90% uh, uptime. Again, much like the ability to work from home in space, this of course is highly correlated with income. So as you discover, lower income Americans, less educated Americans tend to have jobs that can't work from home, tend to have, you know, they have to share space at home if they're gonna do that. They tend not to have as good in internet because internet tends to be better in wealthier urban areas uh, and you know, not poor urban areas or rural areas. And finally, pre-COVID, only 2% of people work from home full-time. So it was really uh, you know, unusual to be full-time. Now, of the roughly 40% of people are working from home, basically all of us are doing it full-time. I think this is a big challenge. I'm not gonna spend too long on this. Uh, but, you know, the three issues that endlessly come up from talking to you know, by now, dozens and dozens of companies over the last three, four months is creativity. So a lot of firms complain that it's very hard to be creative when you're remote. You can maybe continue effectively current activity. It's very hard to start new projects, start new products. You know, the, the prediction is that, for example, the number of patents applications is going to drop in 2021 onwards because of this. Secondly, it's motivation. It's, it's hard to be inspired, you know, sat in your bedroom all day. And thirdly, loyalty. There's an issue that if we're working at home full time indefinitely, the sense of loyalty to an employee is less. You know, I feel loyalty to Stanford in part because I, you know, see and like a lot of my colleagues and hang out with them. And if I was at home full time, you know, that, you know, that would, it would still be there, but it would clearly weaken over time. Um, also, interestingly, in the most recent survey, something has come out. One of the topics that firms have mentioned over uh, a lot of the video conferences I've had with them is it's much harder to hire working from home. The kind of comments I've had is, you know, it's fine for our current employees working from home, but we're not hiring graduate, new, particularly new graduates until we can go back to face-to-face -face working because you can't really train. Like, you know, imagine hiring a 22-year-old from Stanford straight out of college. It's very hard to train them, having them remote working. And so we put in a question on the most recent survey and you find strong evidence that working from home is uh, seeming to have an impact, at least in the short and in hiring. It's making firms much less reluctant to hire. So what about post-COVID? Um, so in a fourth survey, this is something we asked for firms, because it's not really a question you can ask individuals. We asked firms about their forecast of working from home post-COVID. And uh, without going, it's kind of complicated to add, to add up all the data. I can give you a three numbers that are probably the most useful to think about, which is, from the BLS survey, pre-COVID, 5% of working days were spent at home, 95% on business premises. During COVID, we estimate about 40% of working days are spent at home and 60% on business premises. And firms tell us post-COVID, we're going to see about 20% at home and 80% on business premises. So during COVID, that 40% comes from about 40% of workers are working from home. They're doing it full time. Post-COVID, this number comes from about 40% of workers can work from home and firms foresee them doing that half time. So if you think about post-COVID, the best prediction is post-COVID, those of us that work from home can work from home, we'll probably do it half time. And in fact, that matches up very closely with what employees want. So we also asked employees what they would want and there's a huge spread. In fact, one of the big findings is enormous heterogeneity of preferences. So 20% of people never want to work from home post covid 24 percent or roughly a quarter always want to work from home post covid but the large majority you know the majority want something in between with something like two or three days medium so you know i would argue that i think this is going to be permanent so just remember five percent of days pre-covid were working from home 20 percent we forecast post covid working from home for a fourfold increase so i want to argue it's going to be permanent this uptick for four reasons one is Expectation. So working from home has turned out far better than most individuals and firms predict is, you know, outcomes of a recent survey. More than 70% say working from home has been far more effective than they thought. Secondly is stigma. So I gave a TEDx talk on working from home before COVID. Because I, I mean, I've been long been working on working from home. And I had this screen share I put on the YouTube, which is up on YouTube, about uh, the negative stigma of working from home, which is you just punch into Bing working from home and here are the image searches it, it gave out. You can do the same in Google. It's basically identical. Uh, and, you know, if you look at the 
15, the top 15 images, they're basically all really, you know, they're all apart from maybe two really negative, like naked people, people with babies, people, uh, cartoons, etc. Or this, uh, I got sent this thing at the top. It's an email I got sent. It's like spam email, work from home, earn thousands of dollars monthly. Or probably you recognize that there's a very famous song called Work From Home by Fifth Harmony, the US uh, pop group. is their best-selling song. It went quintuple platinum. It was number one around the world. You know, it's a great song. I quite like it, actually. But, it's you know, if you listen to the lyrics, there's nothing to it. There's no work going on in this song. So there's a massive stigma about working from home before COVID. This also seems to have dropped dramatically. So he asked uh, people about their perceptions of the change in stigma, and the large majority said they thought the stigma had reduced the negative stigma from working from home and substantially reduced. Third is investments. Uh, so we've all had to invest in working from home, and this is a sunk cost. It's you know irreversible in terms of hours on the left. You know most graduates, the kind of representative working from home workers invested something like 11 to 12 hours per person on the right we look at expenditures roughly a thousand dollars per person uh and then finally social distancing i don't think social distancing is ever going to fully evaporate so he asked this question if a covid vaccine is discovered and made widely available which of the following would best fit your views on social distancing and the most common op option is substantially return to pre-covid activities but I'd still be wary of things like riding the subway or getting into a crowded elevator. So after a year of wearing masks and being told to stay away, I don't see us all immediately rushing back to, you know, getting in mass transit into downtown city skyscrapers and taking packed elevators up. So, I, you know, this is another reason why I think part of our habit is going to stick, at least in the medium run. So what about tips to wrap up? So there are three key tips. Uh, one is to do this part time. So I'd say something like two days a week. Uh, say Tuesday and Thursday at home, Monday, Wednesday, Friday in the office. The second is optional. So as you see, only 50% of employees want to work from home. And the third is I think it has to be a privilege. So underperformers need to be warned. And if they don't perform, they should be recalled to the office. If you look at this as how can, you know employees report their preferences on them, we ask them how much would working from home two or three days a week as an option be appealing and to trump our actual numbers compared it to a real pay increase and you can see there's some pretty large numbers here so on average employees report working from home to two three days a week will be equivalent to a 13.2 percent increase in pay so given this i can see this being you know the two or three days a week a very popular option and you know the the, the kind of advised option as going forwards so you know, to end, I don't think I get asked a lot, was working from home going to destroy offices? I think the answer is no, I don't think so at all. And in fact, in separate survey data is about to release, the demand amongst American firms for square footage is actually slightly up. Why? So we go from 95 to 80 percent of working days on the business premises. But at the same time, we have social distancing. And the typical figures is firms report roughly wanting twice as much this uh, space per person. And so, you know, the density is half. So you have a 15% reduction in person days in the office, but a 50% increase in uh, space. And so net net space is up. What I think is clear is just the reallocation of space away from things on the left. So this is downtown San Francisco with the two big problems of mass transit and elevators. It's very hard to get people into these skyscrapers and they're now mostly vacant. To the right, things like, you know, the office out of the TV show, uh, which has the big advantages of parking. Uh, and also there's only two or three stories, so you can use the stairs. So, you know, we see this in the surveys. I don't want to spend time on this, but, you know, there's a strong preference to moving out of offices in the long run. So to conclude, I think there's five, three, five things that I see in the long run, at least five-year impact. It's hard to tell longer than that. Um, one is cities. I think there's a reduction in economic activity in particularly daytime uh activity in city centers because of more people working from home less people commuting and particularly the types of higher earning people that used to spend a lot of money during the day in city centers secondly i think there's a shift in property valuations 10 plus story buildings you know you see their resale rates and their rental lease rates have collapsed right now and then actually an increase in value of office parks or what in high silicon valley is often called campuses thirdly reduction in commuting particularly for educated employees Fourthly, I think this is a problem partly for the rebound, particularly for new graduates, that working from home pre presents a challenge to hiring. 
And then finally, I don't, you know, I know others are going to talk about this, but I think this is clearly an issue for inequality, both pay and the ability to work and therefore accrue experience, but also just welfare. The fact that this is seen as a major perk, it's going to accrue more to older employees. And I'll stop there and say, if you interested, uh, I, just, uh, I put out a blog post and there's kind of a working paper in construction uh, on this. And then there's the older QJE paper as well that goes through the experiment in China I skipped over. Okay. Excellent, Nick. Thank you so much. Um, Ed? Great. You know, somewhat amazingly, while Nick was speaking, the president of Harvard sent out an email announcing that 40% uh, of Harvard students will be back on campus in the fall, which is not exactly Nick's proposed 50-50 split, but it's pretty close. So so Larry Bacow <laughs> must, be, must be listening to you, uh, Nick. Um, so let me try and make sure that I'm sharing this. Uh, there we go. Okay. So this is, uh, I'm going to be talking about uh, a number of papers, many of which are uh, already bureau working papers, and they're joined with a series of co-authors, including Mike Luca, Zoe Cullen, Chris Stanton, Marion Bertrand, Alex Bartek, Steve Redding, Caitlin Gorbeck, J.P. Chauvin, and Stephanie Kessel. Um, cities and pandemics have a long history. Uh, this is an image that's often associated with the plague of Athens, which struck that city in 430 BC. Uh, the story behind it was that Pericles had summoned in the farmers into the from the Attic hinterland behind the city's walls so they could ex execute a raiding strategy against their Spartan enemies. The idea was the walls would keep them safe from the Spartan land-based marauders, and they could send out their, their ships uh, to raid the Peloponnesian coastline. Of course, even though the walls worked against the Spartan armies, they did not work against plague, which entered through the port of Piraeus and fundamentally <laughs> devastated uh, the Athenian strategy. Um, for the next 2,400 years, we have been dealing with the fact that urban density enables the spread of foods on a global transportation network that enables the spread of disease across, across oceans and continents. Now, Athens still survived for another 25 years. Um, the plague of Justinian that came to Constantinople in 541 BC, which was the first time Yersinia pestis, the Black Death, had struck at Europe, uh, essentially devastated uh, urban Europe for close to a millennium. Uh, Justinian was on the cusp of being able to reimpose the Pax Romana on the Mediterranean world, but this devastating pandemic that struck essentially destroyed those hopes. And its continued reappearance decade after decade, century after century, basically doomed urban connectivity. Now, over the past 200 years, we've also had plagues. Uh, yellow fever was the curse of early 19th century cities, cholera the curse of mid 19th century cities, and urbanization proceeded despite that. So it is clear that plague and urbanization can coexist, but it is also true that of all the demons that come with density, contagion is the most terrible of them. We have had a blessed century since uh, influenza uh, ended in 1920, where we have gotten used to thinking that urban density can coexist with health. Indeed, life expectancies are now, you know, until COVID, two years longer in New York City than elsewhere. But in 1900, a boy living in New York could expect to live six years less than a boy growing up in rural America. And that was about the same life expectancy gap that existed between London and the rest of Shakespeare's England. Um, so the question is going forward, is density once again uh, a harbinger of, of death and disease? This is across America's counties. This is mid-May, the relationship between population density and per capita deaths from COVID. Um, this is not just New York, and this will show up controlling for, for distance from New York as well. Um, it is also related to the, the share of population taking public transportation, at least across uh, counties. Um, that's buoyed down mostly by the high density Midwestern cities like Detroit, which had a very high level of, of COVID deaths. This is an, a measure of density in Brazil, another place where COVID has struck terribly. Uh, this shows the share of population living in favelas. These are high density, high poverty areas in, in Brazilian cities. Again, significantly more COVID cases in areas in which people are more densely crammed uh, close to each other. This is the population share living in slums. This comes from Sam Asher and Paul Novoset across Indian cities. Again, density is highly related to the, to the spread of this disease. Now, that does not mean that this is permanent. 
we are catching the disease at a cross section. And indeed, the influenza uh, epidemic started in cities, particularly Boston, but then it spread across all of America. And that may well happen. But at least at first, this has proved to be a particular danger to cities and one that may very well, as Nick's talk just suggested, proved at creating a permanent stigma of both high density living, high density work and public transportation. In a sense, the great arc of American employment has placed us in, an, in a situation that makes us uniquely vulnerable to this form of, of droplet carry disease. We've moved from farms to factories to urban service workers, and uh, these urban service jobs have been a safe haven against automation, against the, the rise of outsourcing, against uh, large scale capital deepening, because wealthy urban customers have still been willing to pay for a, a latte if it's served with a smile. And yet these 32 million American workers, one fifth of the labor force, are you know both absolutely on the front lines of the pandemic, as I'll show in a second, but also are at most risk of having their jobs disappear if proximity to another human being becomes a source of peril rather than a source of pleasure. This just shows the movement of jobs, the light blue line that starts at the bottom and ends at the top is manufacturing. Those are jobs which one would think uh, would be pretty easy to work with social distancing. Uh, that's true more in durable goods than in non-durable goods. Those meat packing, packing plants have proven to be particularly dangerous. The middle two lines are leisure, hospitality, and retail trade. That's one fifth of the American labor force altogether. Uh, the top two lines are professional and business services. Those are the ones that Nick alluded to that are particularly good at managing working from home. These are the idea workers who can transmit knowledge, if not loyalty and inspiration via Zoom or via uh, WebEx. And the top are education and health services. These are jobs that, that are ultimately funded with a government backstop. And so they are likely to continue. But of course, as we know, they are also often on the front lines of the pandemic. Um, this comes from a, a business survey uh, that I did with Mike Luca, uh, Alex Bartik, Marion Bertrand, Zoe Cullen, and uh, Chris Stanton. And it just shows us, this was as of April, just the enormous carnage that this industry, that this pandemic created across America's small business ecosystem. 70% of arts and entertainment films were sh firms were shuttered uh, in, this, in this sample as of April. 86% of personal service firms, only banking and finance, uh were remain to be you know predominantly open um also amazing are the share of them that expected to be closed as of december right very high levels of firms believing that they would not survive particularly those and that's the majority of them that have a very modest cash cushion um the this comes from our survey but it turns out that our share temporarily closed is a pretty good job of predicting the official unemployment rate as of april so this is our predicted uh, share, share temporarily closed across uh, states against the unemployment rate. And again, this is working reasonably well. We asked firms, we used a randomization strategy where we, where we keyed them up to, to think about different levels of months, different numbers of months that the pandemic would last. And we asked them what they thought their probability of survival would be if the pandemic lasted one month or four months or six months. Uh, somewhat amazingly, those firms, when we told them, you know, what would happen if, if the pandemic lasted four months, 70% of the restaurants and bars in our sample predicted that they would be shuttered as of December if the pandemic lasted for four years. So uh, the level of carnage is just extraordinary if this thing persists. Now, the, the massively expensive $649 billion Paycheck Protection Program has surely mitigated some of this carnage, but it's hard to think that we will, you know, continue to have the appetite for a, a level of sort of undirected spending of that of that nature going forward. Um, this is just a little thought exercise, which is we asked if those uh, if those those uh, closings turned into job separations that were not made up by new hires, how many Americans would be laid off as a result of this? We come up with a number like 33 million American workers. So it, it's truly an extraordinary disruption if, if indeed it all comes to pass. Um, it's not just about the rules about opening your business. So we also asked firms in a different survey how long they expected to stay shuttered even after uh, they were allowed to reopen. On average, businesses said they expected to be closed for at least two weeks longer, uh, although there was, of course, substantial heterogeneity with some firms saying they would open the day that they were allowed to and others saying that it would take them a while. And that reminds us, of course, that you know restarting the economy is not just a matter of ending the government regulations because firms expect that their demand is going to be substantially curtailed 
for months to come. And this, this shows projections against a, a slightly different sample of small businesses, how much they expect their uh, demand will be there as of different months. And you can see even as September, you know, arts, entertainment, and recreation firms, they expect their, their demand to be down by 45% relative to February of last year. Educational services down 40%, healthcare and social assistance down 30%. Again, finance and insurance seems like it's in the best shape uh, of, of these groups, but uh, really just enormous sense in which anything that is delivered with a face-to-face -face mechanism is, is gonna be facing a shortfall in demand for many, many months, if not years to come. Um, we um, also looked at the extent to which for workers who weren't able to stay from home, were to work from home, were subject to added risk of the disease. So this is joint work with Caitlin Gorbeck and Steve Redding. Um, this shows you the change in trips by zip code in New York taken from the SafeGraph cell phone data uh, and COVID cases per capita. And as you can see, you know the, those zip codes in New York where the, the number of cases shrunk, so those are the darker areas over on the right, those are the lighter areas over on the left, those ones in which the cases are lower. Um, this shows the change in trips and the cases per person. Uh, again, that's a fairly strong relationship. The reasons why you might think that the ordinarily squares uh, coefficient would be biased, which is why we take a strategy that uses the composition of workers before COVID. Um, so we used both the Dingle and Naiman measure of uh, the share of works that could be done, uh, share of jobs that could be done from, from remote locations and the share of jobs that were essential. And essential workers predict uh, a less of a reduction in trips. Telework jobs that are appropriate for teleworking predict more of a reduction in trips. Uh, and then, you know, these are just uh, share of workers in essential services. These shows the, the relationship with deaths per capita across New York City zip code. So these essential services are, are strongly associated with deaths. Then we actually just ran this through. Um, this uh, using our, our IV coefficients show this is across a whole set of cities. Uh, essentially, this is an elasticity of about two or between two and three using our last coefficient, somewhat smaller in the OLS cases. Uh, maybe a little bit lower to one. This means that a 10% reduction in trips is associated with about a 10% reduction in COVID cases. So in, in an elasticity of one, elasticity of two to three, that would mean a 10% reduction is a 20 to 30% reduction in COVID cases. We can also do this in a panel where we match across New York City zip codes, trips with two weeks later cases. Um, there, if you want to look at the IV in the last uh, column, which shows our results with zip code uh, fixed effects, you're getting a coefficient again between one and two. So that's an elasticity between one and two. In this case, 10% reduction in trips, about 16% reduction in COVID cases. This is a larger coefficient. This comes not from the safe graph measures, but from turnstiles public transit data. Again, we're using the same instrumental variables strategy. Uh, you get more of an elasticity of three, but but you know very strong evidence suggesting that restricting your number of trips was protective from this disease, and that those occupations that could not work remotely were more at risk from getting the disease. Now, I'm not going to say much about this because my views aren't that different from from uh, Nick's. Will the burst in remote working become permanent? Uh, will uh, this cause a permanent disruption in cities? Um, so first of all, again, the Dingle and Nyman data does remarkably well at actually predicting which jobs actually have stayed home. So we've actually merged our uh, small business survey with the Dingle and Nyman measures, which come from ONET. We find exactly what they predict, which is that in those industries and occupations where they predict that workers can re work remotely, that's exactly where we are seeing workers that are working remotely during COVID. So this, this measure really does work quite well. What industries are seeing this? Uh, what uh, Where do we actually see places that are working remotely? It's about education, as Nick suggested. Skills are really quite predictive of being able to work remotely. Um, interestingly, actually, industries that are dominated by women are somewhat more likely to be able to work remotely, uh, but that effect is largely uh, explained away by the education share. Um, the um, uh, we also asked about productivity relative to non-worker, relative to non-remote. Again, it's about education. Educated workers are thought to be able to work well remotely. Non-educated workers are, are not. So again, this suggests like it's going to be, a, if this working from remotely becomes a permanent thing, this is an absolute disaster for the lower end of the job market. And, you know, if you think about this prior to uh, 
2019 prior, I, I was mo mostly worried about you know, what would low skilled Americans do in places like West Virginia, whereas I was confident that in cities like Boston and New York, there would be these urban service jobs that provide employment for less skilled Americans. But in a sense, if the world becomes one in which we are all afraid of face to face interactions, then in some sense, all of America, all of the world becomes like West Virginia. My way of asking the questions, our way of asking the questions about what share of this will become remote is slightly different from Nick's, but we come up with a similar number, which is that 40% or more of our firms say that 40% or more of workers um, who have switched to working remotely will stay working remotely after COVID. So 40% of firms say that 40% uh, or more will remain. So that's a pretty big shock. I tend to think in terms of what this means for uh, occupancy, my views are quite similar to Nick's, which is I think that that changing prices, a decline in office rents will mean that the offices will remain occupied, although presumably at slightly lower densities. Um, I would say just be worried about the office park model in San Francisco, in greater San Francisco, where the supply of those is quite restricted, then those prices might go up. In most of America, there's essentially a completely horizontal supply curve for office park space, and so I wouldn't expect the prices there to go up. Um, to the extent to which I have a crystal ball to think about what this will matter for the future of cities, I really think there are you know, two paths ahead. So one of which is, if this thing ends, right, if you know this is a one-shot event if we get back to normal okay then for sure nick is right that we will have several tough years people will continue to be afraid of public transportation people will continue to be afraid of elevators face-to-face -face interactions and it will be very tough for cities international travel will surely be depressed but like people's memory tends to be astonishingly short and if we do not have another pandemic in the next five years I believe fundamentally the strengths of face-to-face -face interaction are such that those things will be will be filled again. Now, will we see a shift? Will we have more young people living in cities relative to old cities? Sure, right? Will we see declining prices in urban areas? I think so, and that's not such a terrible a terrible allocation, but fundamentally our urban world will continue. But if the shock doesn't end quickly, if pandemics reappear, right? If we continue to, to live in a world in which public transportation is not safe, then all bets are off. And then indeed, sort of a fully apocalyptic vision for cities is indeed a possibility, right? And that is also an apocalyptic vision for almost all of less skilled American labor, the labor laborers. And for that reason, I believe that, you know, it's almost impossible for me to imagine a world in which America will not spend whatever it takes to make sure that this pandemic is a one shot event, not something that reappears over and over again, killing both, you know, our urban life and also the job prospects of the millions and millions of workers who labor in face to face jobs. Thank you. Excellent. Excellent, Ed. Thanks so much. Um, Bob? Thank you very much. Uh, open my joint work with Daniel Garot Sanchez, because Omar Esparas, Tara uh, Erzman, Mariana Villas, and Hannah Winkler on who can work from home across the globe. So the world is now in a global lockdown, according to recent estimates of the International Labour Organization. As of June 15th, 32% of the world's labour force lives in countries where closures are fully required and only essential workers can go and perform their jobs. Another 42% live in countries where workplace closures are required for at least some sectors or categories of workers. And another 19% live in countries where closures are recommended. So more or less the entire world is facing lockdowns of one form or another. And that of course makes working from home a very salient determinant of one's job vulnerability as Nick already explained. And recent survey evidence from the US, the UK and Germany shows that indeed workers in jobs that are less amenable to working from home face a much, much higher risk of being laid off. So Adam Spressel and uh, colleagues conducted a survey where they asked workers to rank what share of tasks that a, their job com, uh, consists of could be performed from home. 
And as we can see here quite clearly, those who can perform more jobs from home is a much, much lower propensity of, of being laid off. And that's true across all these, these three countries. But these are developed countries. And so what we're going to do in our paper is gonna, we're going to assess who can work from home across the globe. Assess who's most at risk and speculate on the likely impacts of COVID-19 on labor market inequality. We're going to find that roughly one in five jobs across the globe can be performed from home, but that has enormous heterogeneity. So in rich countries, roughly one in three jobs can be performed uh, from home, but in low income countries, only one in every 26 jobs can be done from home. And this is not just because low income countries have a different economic structure, but also because there are substantial ICT constraints to working from home. So our key contribution will be to account for the importance of internet access. And we're gonna show you that failing to do so will cause you to overestimate the number of jobs that can be performed from home by 25% across the globe, but by as much as like 189% in low income countries. So as already sort of, uh, mentioned, those most at risk are workers who are already more vulnerable. They tend to be workers in low paid jobs, relatively young workers on temporary contracts that are not educated. So as a result, COVID-19 is likely to exacerbate labor market inequality, but paradoxically, especially so in relatively developed countries. And that's because in developed countries, you have a segment of the workforce that can work from home and is, as a result, somewhat insulated from the shock, at least from the labor supply side. We're not looking at labor demand effect in this presentation. Whereas in poorer countries, basically virtually nobody can work from home. So they're actually going to be harder hit, but uh, inequality is going to be less of an issue. So. Our starting point is the already seminal work of Dingle and Neymar, who use the ONET service to classify jobs into ones that can be performed from home and ones that cannot. But their measure, as they themselves sort of concede, is a measure of the theoretical ability to work from home. And they ignore many constraints that may make working from home difficult or impossible. And our contribution is very simple. We're gonna account for the importance of internet access because we believe this to be one of the chief constraints to working uh, from home. Uh, adjust this measure and then assess impacts on inequality and then identif identify workers who might be at particularly elevated risk of being laid off because of COVID. So our first, task is to identify jobs that require internet to be performed. So to do this, we're also gonna rely on ONET surveys. And we're gonna use two questions in particular. The first one being, how important is working with computers for the performance of your job? And the second one is, how frequently does your current job require electronic mail? So these questions are scored on a scale from one to five, with five being very important. And we classify a job as requiring internet access if the combined score to these questions exceeds A. And as a result, 55% of SOC A-digit occupations uh, require the internet to be performed at home. Then this allows us to identify within the set of jobs that can be potentially performed from homes, the ones that require internet access to do so. The second step is then, to identify who actually has internet access. So unfortunately, data on internet tends to be patchy, but we, we use data on internet usage from the Gallup World Poll, which has the advantage of providing a crude estimate of internet usage by crude income level. So it has information on internet usage for the top 60% and the bottom 40% of the income distribution by country. We're gonna combine this data with information on wages by occupation from ILO stat. So we're gonna rank in each country occupations in terms of the wages they pay on average, and then 
assign these occupations to the top 60% or the bottom 40%. And that's going to give us a country specific measure of internet penetration by occupation. So this then allows us to correct the Dingo Management Index, if you will, for the need for and availability of the internet. And then we assess sort of how many people can work from home across the globe. And the graph here on the right shows you that the share of jobs that can be performed from home increases rapidly with development. And especially so if we account for internet access. So that's the blue line here. And that's because low income countries not only have fewer jobs that in theory can be performed from home to start with, they also have far worse uh, internet access. So in a sense, poor countries face a double disadvantage. Now, the differences between the, or this red line, the Dingle name and index, and the blue line may not seem very large, but once you start thinking about the bias that would be induced by ignoring that access, actually the difference is quite striking. So when we split up the type of jobs that can be performed from homes and ones that require the internet and jobs that could be performed if you had internet, and then split workers into workers who have internet and workers who don't, then we see that in high income countries, there are 3.3% of all jobs could in principle be performed from home, but in practice, workers are unlikely to be able to do so because they like the internet. Uh, but there's not a 3.7% of jobs that are conditional on having internet access to be able to be performed at home. So roughly one in 11 jobs that can be performed from home aren't uh, performed from home because of internet access. But if you look at low income countries on the right hand side, you see that even though roughly 11% of all jobs could be performed from home, 7.2% of them of 7.2% of that 11%, one cannot perform from home because of internet constraints. So two out of three jobs that you couldn't theory perform from home, you cannot because of ICT constraints, if you believe our numbers. So accounting for internet access is really important for low income countries and matters a great deal. And I think this is somewhat consistent with uh, the fact that you know Nick was talking about internet access in the U.S. already being constrained uh, for for some workers, so you can only imagine you know what it's like for workers in developing countries. Now, this association between uh, the share of jobs that can be performed from home and development that we see across countries also obtains within countries. So, if we rank regions in terms of their regional uh, output per capita, and we plot the share of jobs that can be performed from home uh, against that level of income, we see very clearly that richer regions, relatively typically, have more jobs that are amenable to working from home. So this is true in Brazil, this is true in Mexico, this is true in Turkey, this is true in, true in India, and this is true in the EU. So by implication, COVID-19 likely to exacerbate inequality. And Ed Glazer already pointed out, you see it at the individual level, a strong correlation between pay and the ability to work from home. Pretty much everywhere in the world, but this association is particularly strong in high income countries. So in other words, if you think about a negative shock, then that prevents people uh, from, from going to the office or their place of work. That shock is going to be particularly damaging in low income countries. Or in other words, the inequality created by uh, uh, COVID is likely 
to be highest in rich countries. So to illustrate this point, we do a very crude counterfactual analysis of what the change in inequality uh, because of changing incomes would look like post COVID, assuming respectively a 30% uh, loss in earnings for jobs that cannot be performed from home uh, in red and a 50% uh, loss in earnings for jobs that cannot be performed from home. And as we can see here, the change in inequality is much, much higher in richer countries where relatively more people can work from home. And as a result, there's likely to be more inequality. But of course, this graph hides the fact that the poor countries where far fewer people can work from home are going to be hardest hit. And to end, we also analyze using individual representative labor force survey data, the determinants of having a job that you can do from home. And we see that those jobs are more likely to be held by workers who are relatively older and strikingly much more likely to be held by educated workers and particularly workers with tertiary education. So the college graduates uh, that Nick Loom already talked about and much less likely to be held by workers on temporary contracts. So this is worrisome because it strongly suggests that you know, the burden of COVID-19 absent remedial action is going to be disproportionately shouldered by workers who are already in a more precarious labor market position to start with. So to sum up, globally, one in five jobs can be done from home. The ratio is one in three in high income countries and one in 26 in low income countries. Internet access matters a great deal. Failing to account for it would cause one to overestimate the share of jobs that can be performed from home at the moment by 25%, but by roughly a factor of three in low income countries that are lacking uh, the most in, in internet access. And COVID seems very likely to exacerbate income inequality, especially in rich countries where there's sort of the biggest difference between people who are protected from crisis to some extent because they can work from home and people uh, cannot. And its burden is likely to be particularly harsh on those who are already in a vulnerable position. So people lacking education, young people on temporary contracts. So that's it for me. Thanks very much. Thanks, Bob. Um, very sobering. David. Cool. Can you, whoops. Can you see my screen? Can you hear me? Um, yes, on both counts. Oh, terrific. Okay, uh, great. Well, it's a pleasure to be here. Uh, it's a challenge to speak after three such excellent talks and hope to say something uh, 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 complimentary. I have not been changing my slides in real time, but hopefully this will amplify some of the points and add a few new points. And I'm gonna be talking about the labor market after the COVID crisis, and my theme is uh, too few low paid jobs. So um, let me start by where we were headed uh, pre-COVID. And really there, there are four points to this. Uh, one was uh, is polarized occupational growth. Uh, the second is uh, closely related movement to low paid personal services concentrated among non college workers. Uh, we uh, there was a lot of growth in low wage jobs, but there was a tightening labor market for uh, both uh, cyclical and secular uh, uh, reasons. And so we had an expectation of rising wage pressure in uh, low paid services. Let me just fill that in a little bit further. So first, many of you have seen variants of this type of figure showing you that uh, we have a lot of growth in low paid uh, uh, service, security, uh, cleaning, uh, uh, health aid occupations, a lot of growth in professional, technical and managerial occupations, and a very relatively less job growth in the middle in production and office clerical. That's well known. Uh, also important to bear in mind that most of that growth in um, uh, 
uh, in these uh, movement into low paid services is among workers without a college education. So with some college or lower, in many cases, high school or lower, but even some college looks a lot like uh, those with uh, less than, lo looks a lot like high schoolers and, and those with less than a high school degree. So this is really a phenomenon that's concentrated among the less educated. Um, if you look at uh, Bureau of Labor Statistics, just projections of job growth, obviously pre-COVID, they actually have a fairly good record of this. These are the, the occupations that they project will add numerically uh, the most jobs between 2018 and 2028. Uh, they account for 55% uh, uh, of all projected job growth, uh, and they are concentrated in health aids, food and cleaning services, labor occupations. Uh, most of these have uh, uh, average wages that are or median wages that are well below the national median. Many of these uh, fast growing jobs are jobs that pay uh, typically uh, 25 to $35,000 a year. So, you know, personal care aides, uh, food serving workers, uh, home health aides, waiters and waitresses. Uh, there are some high paid jobs in there, software developers, uh, uh, nurses, uh, management an analysts, but a lot of the projected growth has been in relatively less educated or relatively low paid, mostly hands on, uh, physically demanding uh, in person jobs. Um, this was, uh, has a, a uh, uh, combines with another uh, factor, which is uh, rising old age dependency in across the industrialized world. So that old age dependency is the ratio of people 65 plus to those 16 to 64. And uh, in most countries, that is projected to rise substantially over the next 30 years. Uh, and so that creates uh, the, the uh, creates a lot of demand for services, a lot of demand for the elderly for uh, activities that can be provided by the young without many young people present. Uh, and especially when you consider uh, extremely low fertility, that means that uh, we would expect to have a lot of continued growth for these service activities without a lot, lot of new labor supply to them. And one way you can see that is just to look at the changing age distribution of the US workforce. Uh, and you can see in 2000 how much mass was in the kind of working age section, that's the red line. And then if you look at 20 years later, uh, how much less mass is in the working age uh, share and how much more is in among senior adults and also how much less is among children youth and students. And so, you know, we, they're really, um, there are two separate phenomena that should, uh, that are often mentioned together, but in fact are distinct. One is the aging of the baby boom. And that was an inevitable consequence of, of things that happened decades ago. And that means we would necessarily have a, a large number of uh, relatively old people uh, in the population. The other is the recent slowdown in fertility. And that you know, is independent of the baby boom, but it, it exacerbates this phenomenon because we uh, we have a, a slowing labor force growth, and of course that is uh, uh, that is amplified by our now extremely severe immigration restrictions uh, that are reducing the supply of, uh, of typically uh, relatively young workers who would do many of these in-person activities. And then, ironically, uh, very steep rises in educational attainment, attainment also have the effect of slowing people's, uh, reducing the fraction of workers who are interested in doing this type of work. Um, one uh, manifestation that you see of this, which is a positive manifestation, is if you look in the most recent, from let's say 2015 to 2018, so uh, prior to the current crisis, um, you could see a lot of wage growth. Uh, among low educated workers. So these are these are uh, real wages indexed uh, from 1963 uh, to 2017. And the red and the, the series starting from bottom to top are high school dropout, high school grad, some college, college graduate and greater than college. And what you can see is uh, after 2015 as the labor market tightens, uh, hourly wage levels appear to rise for all groups, but probably the steepest rises are among the least educated. And that corresponds with the red line. Uh, and, and as that has occurred, uh, the rate, the employment rate of people with criminal histories has risen. The employment rate of people with uh, work limitations has risen. So this has been a, a, a fabulous labor market in terms of expanding uh, the set of uh, opportunities available to people who traditionally have trouble finding work and increasing wages in that type of work. So that's all been uh, for the good. So now let me talk to uh, how this is going to change or how I expect it's going to change. 
let me say there are really four ways, actually there are many ways, but here are four ways that I can think of in which the COVID crisis is gonna, is changing the labor market. Uh, the first of those uh, is telepresence. Um, so uh, my uh, MIT colleague, David Mendel, who, who early in his career worked on undersea exploration, uh, has made the remark uh, uh, in one of his books that remote presence is a form of automation. Uh, and we don't tend to think of it this way, uh, but uh, when we do things remotely, we are in some sense uh, automating all of the commuting we would be doing and all of the ancillary activities associated with getting ourselves from place to place and being physically elsewhere. Uh, and so this kind of breakthrough in, uh, in uh, telepresence that we have all quickly learned how to do it uh, is, uh, is going to, I think, have you know, quite lasting effects. And arguably, this would have happened. It certainly would have happened over time. But many of us probably uh, uh, underappreciated how much better the technology had become and, uh, and probably over, uh, overestimated the centrality of being physically present for things. This applies for telecommuting, uh, for telemedicine, which has grown uh, spectacularly during the crisis, and uh, for business meetings, which includes a lot of, uh, of uh, business travel. So why is that significant? Um, well, it's going to affect, uh, as, uh, as both Nick and Ed mentioned, many of these service jobs that have been growing so rapidly. Right? So in 2019, you know, about 9% of jobs were in food prep and serving, 8.5% uh, in transportation, 3% in buildings cleaning, 4.6% in protective service, uh, another of the same share in personal service, and also retail sales. Uh, many of those, in effect, are demand for those is driven by people going out to lunch at work, people needing their buildings and offices uh, clean, people needing to stay at hotels, taking Uber, and so on. The entire hospitality industry is driven by business class travelers, right? Most of us, when we fly on a plane, we're just, we're basically, you know, pretty close to luggage. Uh, the, the people who are actually paying, uh, making this, the flight profitable are the business class travelers. They're also the people who are paying, you know, uh, full, uh, uh, full, full uh, hotel rates on weekdays and going out to expensive restaurants. If those things decline, as I, as I, sure, I think they surely will, uh, then that means declining demand for many of these supporting activities done by less educated workers. Um, uh, you, for example, I was uh, on a conference call with uh, uh, someone who, who is in the private sector who has uh, 200 economists working under him uh, all over the world. Uh, and uh, he made the point, he says, look, when this crisis is over, I'm never letting those guys travel again as much as they traveled before. And it's not for safety. It just, it wasn't worth the money. I didn't realize it till now, uh, but it's not. So the second point I want to make, and this is closely related to the first and very closely related to both uh, what, what both Nick and Ed said, is this relationship to uh, urban density. So uh, uh, this is a figure uh, from my Eli lecture in 2019, and it shows you the changes in the occupational employment shares among non-college workers uh, in three categories. One is what uh, low paid services, transportation, construction, labor, that's the left-hand panel. The second is middle skill production, clerical, administrative, and sales. Uh, and the third is uh, high paying professional, technical, and managerial jobs. The x axis in this figure is population density. So on the far right are you know, uh, uh, dense cities like New York. Then you get, uh, as you move leftward, you get metropolitan areas and suburbs, then rural areas. And then the different colored lines correspond to the passage of time. So, for example, if you look at the blue line, uh, that corresponds to the occupational shares in 1970. And you can see that uh, as you move up the density gradient, the fraction of non-college workers working in traditionally low paid services falls steeply, and the fraction working in middle paid production, clerical, admin jobs rises steeply. And those differences are on the order of 25 percentage points. So cities had a very different texture of work for uh, non-college workers. If you follow that over subsequent decades, so from the blue line to the red line to the green line to the uh, orange line down to the kind of teal line, uh, what you see is that urban gradient in middle skill work disappears. And uh, so we say, well, where are all those non-college workers going? Well, they're not going into professional, technical, and managerial work. Uh, they're instead found in many of these services. 
uh, in, uh, in, uh, in restaurants, in food service, in transportation, in cleaning, in construction, and labor positions. So the, uh, what this says is that uh, the, most of the job growth for the less educated in cities has been exactly these set of services, the ones that Ed was talking about that require physical proximity, uh, that uh, depend on density. And, uh, and that's much more true now than it was 45 years ago. So if uh, people are commuting more from home, uh, if people are traveling less, if people realize they you know, no longer need to cross continents to attend 90 minute meetings uh, and can do that remotely, that is going to change very directly uh, labor demand uh, for, this, uh, for this set of workers. Okay, the third point I wanna make and, uh, uh, is about uh, large firms. So uh, the survey data uh, that Ed brought up suggested that uh, many firms will not survive uh, at this valley of death, depending on how long it goes. And of course, the the uh, the likelihood of uh, not of non survival of perishing is uh, a function of size. Larger firms are better capitalized; they have deeper pockets. They're much more likely to uh, make it through to the other side. Well, why is that important? Uh, well, this is a figure from a working paper by Kerrigan Vincent. Uh, this is uh, showing you uh, the relationship between uh, the size of firms or their share of value added and uh, their labor share, the fraction of value added paid to workers. So if you look at 1967, you sort of see a nice bell-shaped curve. Uh, uh, the, uh, the largest category of firms um, also had uh, the about average labor share. So firms that contributed the most to value added, let's say, you know, uh, uh, 0.16 in the middle, uh, they were also had about the average amount of uh, allocation of, of uh, value added between, between workers and between owners and, uh, and uh, owners of capital or owners of firms. If you look in 2012, what you see is uh, uh, that the labor, the, the firms that now contribute the largest part of value added on the left-hand side uh, have the smallest labor shares, right? So in other words, big, less labor intensive, more capital intensive firms have uh, grown as a share of all economic activity. And in a recent paper with uh, Larry Katz and Christina Patterson, John Van Rena and David Dorn, who covers the QGA, we show that this reallocation of sales and value added from smaller firms to larger firms has contributed to the fall in labor share of national income in the United States. So that, that labor share has fallen five to seven percentage points since around 2020. That's a very steep fall. Uh, an important part, excuse me, since the year 2000, excuse me, an important part of that has been uh, the reallocation of uh, of sales and value added to bigger firms. So, you know, Walmart replacing uh, many small uh, stores. Uh, you uh, you have big health companies replacing uh, uh, smaller uh, uh, um, uh, pharma uh, pharmacies and so on. And so this uh, so this is relevant to this discussion because, of course, uh, if small firms don't survive, that means that. Uh, labor share will fall further, that we'll have more of output uh, 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 produced by uh, big employers uh, and uh, capital intensive employers. Now, that doesn't mean a fall in national income in any sense, and in many ways those firms are more productive, but it does mean a fall in labor share of income, and that intrinsically means a rise in inequality. Since ownership of capital is much, much more concentrated than ownership of labor, we hope at most everyone owns uh, one unit of labor. Uh, finally, um, the fourth point I would make is just is one of automation forcing. So uh, here's an example. Here's an MIT warehouse disinfecting robot uh, being used at a Boston food bank. Uh, if you look around in the crisis, just anecdotally, you'll see many examples of uh, technologies that could potentially have been used that were available that probably wouldn't have been developed or deployed or wouldn't have been cost effective uh, until uh, the crisis struck would likely have come online eventually, but were sort of pulled forward into the present uh, by necessity. So drones delivering medical supplies, uh, warehouse disinfecting robots, uh, human temperature checking drones, uh, the, the uh, likely surge of automation in meatpacking. Um, many of the firms that we have spoken with through the MIT Work of the Future Task Force in small and medium-sized manufacturers have just remarked that they haven't adopted new technology, but they figured out ways to make it, to get by with less labor, that they realized they could reorganize production uh, and, uh, and, and accomplish the same thing using fewer workers. They didn't know that, 
uh, that's a management innovation, but as, as Nick's work has taught us abundantly, uh, management is a form of technology and you can have technological advances uh, in management. When that, uh, these are all a response to a temporary labor shortage, we will be moving into a period of labor surplus shortly, uh, assuming uh, the risk goes down, um, but firms won't unlearn these lessons. Uh, they won't unlearn the ways they've learned to use more machinery and less labor. And uh, now the, a temporary reduction in, in wage pressure uh, may cause them not to automate as quickly, but once the labor market tightens again, uh, all of these things will come off the shelf. So uh, let's see, to summarize, so I think there, there are four key ways that the labor market will, diff will look different. One is telepresence. Two is the change in structure of urban lives. I, I don't want to be a person who predicts the death of cities. Uh, uh, people that has that prediction has been made many times, but I think it will change cities and will change suburbs as 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 well. Uh, the reallocation of activity towards large firms, and finally, generalized automation forcing. I'm sure there there are many examples that we don't yet know about that will likely turn out to be important ex post. So. Um, all of this leads to what I'm just gonna call too few low paid jobs. This likely inward shift in demand for services, reduced business travel, more telecommuting, a shrunken retail sector. Uh, potentially the reduced centrality of cities to knowledge work, we don't know. Uh, and um, the general slackening of the labor market for, less, for lower paid workers means less wage pressure. And that wage pressure was a very good thing. I think one wild card in all this is a potential rise in early retirement that many people who have left the labor market uh, temporarily during the COVID crisis who are closer to retirement age may decide both for reasons of health and also for reasons of uh, other change in status that they don't want to return. And if so, that will also change labor demand. So let me just conclude uh, with a remark that uh, much as we lament the growth of low paid jobs, too few low paid jobs is worse than too many. Uh, and I'm afraid that's the period in, that we are entering now. I'll stop there. Thank you. Great, David. Thank you very much. Um, so there's one question from our audience on um, sensitivity to um, how long this um, the plague will go on. Um, you, do you see any? I mean, we already had from. Definitely. Um, do you do you see any difference in your prognostications from in your prognosis about whether this is a three month thing or a two year thing? Asking asking me specifically? Sure. Anybody else can jump into it. I think Ed actually gave a much better better answer to that. So let me turn it over to Ed. Sure. We, I mean, we had we asked the businesses, and there was there was a huge difference. Uh, I don't know about um, I, I don't know, but we didn't ask two years. I think, but given that we're getting close to zero survival after six months, uh, I think I think it's it's uh, uh, and just to you know just just to remind you the sort of numbers that we were looking at. Um, if if we had a prediction of uh, six months, we we thought that uh, the, the small businesses said that they were restaurants. Eighty five percent said that they would be permanently closed if the if the lockdown lasts for for six months. 66% uh, of all retailers except groceries thought that they would be closed. So, uh, you know, it's not clear what what they understood the shutdown to be entirely. You know, this is not a, you know, clearly we're coming back with some degree of openness, but the pandemic threat has not disappeared. But for sure, for the survival of particular small businesses is going to be very sensitive to that. But of course, you know, new small businesses will form. Um, so it's true that individual small businesses will shut down, but the ability of, of new businesses to, you know, come about then and, you know, will happen. Of course, that will also depend upon the financing conditions and the regulatory framework and how difficult we make for new businesses to start. And I think there's no question uh, that David is right, that large firms are in much better shape for, for surviving this than small firms are. I mean, that's that's absolutely correct. And so the inequality created aspects of large firms is likely to be, be strengthened by this phenomenon. Bill, I, I'm just going to make a comment. I think what's in, interesting is what form we go going forwards. So, in some senses, the current situation where there's lot, you know, partial opening is, in some senses, the most that lasts for a long time. It's the most extreme for locking in some of the trends. So, 
you know, for example, on David's automation or, you know, as, as Bob and N and I've talked about working from home, if businesses can provide services, but they're forced to socially distance for the next year, you can imagine what's going to happen. We're just going to solidify what's occurring now, which is we continue to work from home because we've got to operate, but we don't get in. So I've talked to, you know, tons of businesses now are saying, look, it turns out it's working pretty well. We're going to have to do it for the next nine months. You can imagine if you're a firm and you've had to decamp for a year and a half by the time the pandemic ends, you're basically in a new steady state. You know, many firms will not go back to where they were after it's been working for a year and a half. So in some sense, there's a kind of partial lockdown is going to, you know, that's, in, you know, the, the the strongest way to, I think, lock in, you know, uh, de-densification or automation working from home and mean that even when eventually, whatever, you know, the, the median forecast, if you've seen them are now, are something like, you know, a year to 18 months to, for a vaccine to be widely available. So that turns out to be true. We've had almost two years of this by the time that comes out. And I think a lot of these trends are just going to be locked in. You know, there's a going back to adjustment costs. Once you've done something for two years, it's quite hard to reverse. And also you've become more efficient on it. I think come back to David, there's, there's increasing anecdotal evidence. I was, trying to, I was actually trying over the weekend, trying to find more hard data on it. But for technological changes, for example, around working from home, Facebook argue, uh, put out something saying they just improved their security and various tele protocols to make it easier to do it. And they've been working on it. So you can imagine, I think there's lots of R&D going into various of these areas. Great. Um, two more questions. One is uh, on the supply side, which is that we've been seeing the educational uh, process uh, interrupted by this, by the COVID as well, and that over the long run is going to have an impact on the distribution of education society. Is there any thinking about how that's going to interact with the demand side uh, issues you've been talking about? And another was on rural areas, whether anyone's thought about, we've seen disruption of food networks or transportation networks. Um, has anybody given any thought to, um, to both to the uh, agricultural and food supply networks, both globally, but also within developing countries? I'd be happy to speculate on the education point. So, I mean, one of the things I think that's been surprising to us or maybe in ex post should not have been surprising at elite universities uh, is that we had anticipated there'd be a lot of deferrals, a lot of people saying, well, I'm not going to pay full freight tuition if I can't come to campus. Like, what kind of a rotten deal is that? It's like the, the world's most overpriced streaming service. Uh, but um, actually, people have said, well, you know, the, 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 the product is going to be kind of terrible, but the opportunity cost is really low. And so uh, people who can afford it uh, are investing in human capital or investing in education. I think uh, you'll see a lot of that. However, uh, simultaneously, uh, this can be quite disequalizing. First of all, if you have to, if uh, education is expensive, many people are not going to feel inclined to borrow for schooling if they're not from uh, affluent families. Additionally, the disruptions of trying to learn from home are greater in households that have poor uh, internet, that have little space, that have lots of disruptions. And we don't even know, if you think about the longer term human capital pipeline, people right now in you know primary um, school, middle school, uh, high school, how much are they building the skills that they're going to need for further human capital investment down the road? And again, the evidence is, uh, or at least, I'm sorry, the anecdotes are <laughs> uh, that, you know, in affluent households, uh, you know, kids have, uh, have supervision, uh, they have space, uh, maybe the rate of learning hasn't fallen off as dramatically. Uh, but in uh, outside of that, where uh, there's there's less opportunity for parental supervision, less uh, less necessarily not necessarily human capital for the tutoring and instruction where parents take the place of teachers, which has happened in many households and with more interruptions, it's going to be hard, harder for kids to learn. So I think that, you know, the physical separation from schooling is much more costly for some than others and it's urgent to get kids back into public schools for this reason so so david david's certainly right um i think to think when you think about the college side there's a huge amount of demand for college as consumption rather than learning right and if you think about what the 40 percent of students will be coming back to harvard are about they all the instruction will be virtual right we've already been told that all of the teaching will be online 
right? They're there to interact with other students. And I think that is a huge part when you think about the sort of future of the urban world as well, is the demand of, you know, for density, not because you need to be there to go, go into your office, but because that's what's fun is all about if you're under the age of 35. And we've certainly seen in the sort of rise of cases in Florida and Texas and California, the extraordinary willingness of young people to brave the disease just to be with other young people. You know, that's it's a perfectly understandable thing. Uh, and so I think that's going to be a lot of the continued demand for urban density. Uh, that's going to be, in some sense, a, a bulwark of, of continued demand for that. Just on rural space, we worried a lot uh, as part of the, the International Growth Centers, uh, which I, I co-lead their cities program, uh, advice to developing world uh, cities and countries. We worried a lot about the food networks. Uh, you know, for example, when Uganda instituted their shutdown initially, they actually shut down food, food supplies as well, which was absolutely catastrophic. Um, I don't think that there's much evidence to suggest this is going to be a problem in the wealthy world. But uh, absolutely, when we think about the impact of, of prolonged lockdowns on the food supply issues in the developing world, uh, that would be a huge issue. Uh, I think the one you know saving grace of that is, is for most developing world countries that I've talked to, they've probably they've pretty much just given up on lockdowns. They've decided this this thing is over. Whatever whatever disease we get, we get. But we're not going to go through this again, and we're just going to charge charge ahead for good or for ill. Okay, uh, another question which you might have expected, which is given all the bad things that are going to happen to people at the bottom of the distribution, what should government policy be? Um, so this is going to get us into all those issues of universal income support and the like. Any thoughts? I, I was saving room for others, but I'm happy to, to jump in quickly. Let me just say that you know, the government would, faced uh, three options uh, when it was designing the CARES Act, or Congress did. One was to support workers, one was to support firms, and one was to support households. And uh, they chose all three, <laughs> uh, right? So the Paycheck Protection Program, uh, the extension of the unemployment insurance system. So PPP was for businesses and workers. The unemployment system insurance extension was for workers. And then the payments were for households. Uh, there's, it's controversial, there, sorry, there's no controversy that, that has done a lot. Uh, it's controversial how much it's done. There's a paper that claims that poverty fell during the pandemic. It's not clear that that's contentious. Um, so uh, the first thing we should take note of is how remarkable that is. You know, we often think, oh, the government can't act quickly. The government can't respond to a crisis. It's too outmoded. It's too slow. But the truth is, there's nothing. Uh, no one. There was no substitute for governance in this case. No private entity, no firm could have said, oh, we'll just take, you know, five or 10 percent of GDP and just distribute it across business households and workers. Uh, it's been remarkable and it's encouraging. Uh, it ought to uh, give us renewed appreciation of how central the uh, the public, you know, the, our uh, shared governance is for well-being. In terms of going forward, uh, I uh, there's there's clearly a, let me put it this way. If we stop all supports, uh, you know, at the end of this month, uh, we will have a much bigger problem on our hands. It's much less expensive to spend the money now than to let us move into a much deeper recession. Uh, I'll stop there and leave room for others. Bill, I, I was going to make a comment. But I want to actually build on what Bob said. So I think a hugely important thing is uh, internet connectivity. I, I'm totally aligned with his comment that that you know being able to work from home is not enough. It's not the same as actually being able you know working from home. In the U.S., we see around a third of people can't connect at home effectively, and part of it's broadband rollout. That's more around rural areas. Part of it's actually the cost and affordability of broadband in urban areas. So there's a lot of Americans that aren't connected to broadband because it's too expensive, in part because broadband supply is often monopolistic. So uh you know this is more micro I, i'm totally in line with what david said by the way don't I, you know this kind of the uh macro stimulus and various welfare programs the other much narrower program that's jumped dramatically up the uh priority is exactly on bob's presentation which is getting connectivity because without connectivity even if you could work from home you can't and it turns out even in the us that's strongly correlated with income I, I, I want to just chime in on universal basic income post COVID for a second. So uh, I, before COVID, I was a deep critic of universal basic income. I will be a deep critic of universal basic income when COVID is, is over, if hopefully it is over. I think during the period of COVID, just giving people checks, checks is absolutely fine. 
because we don't at all want to encourage them to work. It's fine to just pay the money. After COVID is over, I am terrified of an America where 30 percent, 40 percent of the population is fundamentally not working. Uh, we know that sort of not working is associated with misery on a grand scale. Uh, and just giving people checks is the surest way to make sure that firms entrepreneurs stop figuring out ways to employ less skilled Americans. And so if you give me any sort of a choice, which is direct money towards employment subsidies, direct money towards training, direct money towards broadband, anything that is work enhancing as opposed to work killing, I will prefer that over universal basic income. Okay. Um, all right, we have 30 seconds left. Um, so I'd like, if any of you had a last message to deliver to are pretty extensive audience actually um last last words i think i just got some of yours ed nick beyond connectivity um, yeah I, I mean i i don't have much to say beyond this is like i think this will fundamentally change things i think the question by the way and how long it lasts is really critical i whether it by the way, Ed raised earlier about future pandemics. I'm somewhat more pessimistic about repeat events, just if we look back on the history. There's 57, 58, there's 67, there's you know, near misses in Ebola, COVID, MERS, uh, SARS. I think if I, you know, from talking to firms, quite a few firms have raised this issue. They're nervous that they go back to the office. One of these things happens again in five to 10 years. So I think even, you know, the probabilistic distribution is going to put some pressure down on us. But. I don't want to be too pessimistic, you know, economists <laughs> are dismal enough as it is. But, you know, for, also for me, it's fantastic to listen to the others. I really enjoyed hearing, you know, Ed, Bob and David. Bob, last thought? Thanks very much. Can, can I just say one, can I just say one response to, to Nick, which is that probability distribution is not fixed. We can take public actions. We can make investments in virology and immunology and in uh, all sorts of things, which can lower that probability in the future. And I think this has taught us that it is worth spending tens of billions of dollars if we are to save the trillions do of dollars that future pandemics will cost us. If I can just add one final thing, I mean, my I'm guilty of, more guilty of this than anyone, but my presentation was really focused on the U.S. But I think the implications for the developing world and both the disease, direct disease challenge they it will face and is facing and the disinvestment of the rich world and sort of losing sight of that and of course all the economic linkages the slowdown here is having there uh, means that the you know the longer term costs will be larger for less affluent societies and i hope uh that we i, I don't expect it but i hope it that we will redouble efforts uh to uh to provide kind of global so social insurance or at least global social assistance uh to deal with this inevitable fallout Bob and uh, David for your insights. I'm getting fantastic reviews here on the chat. So thank you very much. Um, and thank all of you who uh, stayed with us for the last hour and a half. Um, stay tuned for the next um, seminar on the impacts of COVID on our operations. Thank you all very much. Great job, everyone. Thank you. Thanks, Phil. Thank you all. Great, thanks.